for the home equity line of credit, you said it's at a, she has an introductory rate, 1.99% for a year, and it expires uh, June next year. So she's already had the HELOC for a little while. And the the number 148.99620, is that the credit limit or is that how much she owes? Oh, that's the balance right now. Okay. Got it. So what's interesting is that the mortgage balance itself is actually much less, only 74000 So do you know what the credit limit is on the HELOC? I don't think she, she gave me that. I can see if I can call her right now. She gave me some yeah, send her an email. And if she responds during during the conversation here, that would be great. If not, no big deal. But I'm, I'm assuming that it's close to being maxed out i'm assuming you said she did repairs on her primary home right okay so now we owe this money the monthly payment right now is 1471 on it and we're at a really low interest rate so the the best thing she can do for herself right now is velocity banking on the line of credit itself so the the five thousand five one four sixteen uh, is she paid on a monthly basis or is she paid bi-weekly? Okay. So basically two times per month, roughly. And then there's certain months out of the year. I think two of them where, where there's three paychecks. The breakdown would be two times per month. Money goes in. And then we've got this 4,321.94 of, of bills, right? Money going out. But the moment we start doing Velocity Banking, we start dumping our income in, this payment technically goes away. And the only thing where we're paying is interest with, within that 1471. So, so what we know so far, if I was to map out all these, all these payments here, we got the 1471, the 30, 30, 38, 16, 78, 192, 05, 262. And then we got the mortgage itself. So far, I've got calculated 3,383.93 of, of debt payments. The student loans, she didn't put a monthly payment. Um, do you know if this if her total student loan debt is 21,000? Or was it like 21,000, 22,000, 21,000? Like I saw it written like multiple times in the email. Yeah, I would that's, that's, she, she um, itemized all of her student loans she had, but Right now, she's only paying fifty four dollars per month to live. She, she said she's going to recertify you to like you know, to not pay to pay a minimum amount to what that's what she basically she paying right now fifty four dollars towards it like towards her student loans right now. It's about fifty thousand. Okay. <laughs> So I'm just going to add the 54. She's probably on an income-driven repayment plan, assuming. So 3,437.93 debt payments minus 14, 3, 4, 3, 7, minus 1,071. So moving forward, what's what will actually be coming out of the HELOC is 1,966.93. Of debt payments the rest being living expenses right so throughout the month we now have debt payments thousand nine six six ninety three and then her living expenses according to this four thousand three two one nine four minus three thousand four thirty seven ninety three might want to verify this sometimes people forget things they don't put all their expenses in but that seems pretty low unless she's married and there's a dual income going on and other someone else is paying other bills. That could very well be the case. Um, so I would just kind of verify that because 884.01 is pretty low cost of living. That's just like living expense, food, gas, phone bill, you know, electric, internet, cable, that kind of a stuff. Um, and then this number was uh, debt payments. So, so far, just based off what we have, what we know, 1,966.93 is coming out throughout the month. 884.01 is money coming out of the HELOC throughout the month. Now, some of this 884 could get spent on a credit card first for cash back rewards. And then the HELOC, we would make one withdrawal to the credit card on the due date and pay the statement balance in full 
and that helps keep more of her income staying in the HELOC for a longer period of time. Okay. All right. So the goal right now, she made these major renovations, and even though every other debt is at a higher interest rate than the HELOC at 1.99%, you would you would think naturally, okay, let me take this extra cash flow and start paying down some of these credit cards, then the car, um, then student loan, then mortgage, right? And then HELOC. HELOC is the highest balance right now out of all the debts. Now, the, pr the problem she will face come June 2024, which is not too far out from now, we're in November now, 2023, is, yeah, she'll probably pay off this credit card, this credit card, this one right here, and probably some of that credit card, or she skips over the business ones and, and goes to the car. She might be able to knock out maybe a good four debts, so she'll get a couple hundred dollars in cash flow. But then this 1.99 is going to expire, and this monthly payment is going to jump like really bad on her, right? So to give an exam, to give an example, 148,996, 20 times 1.99 percent divided by 12. Her interest only payment right now is $247. Really low, right? Like super low. 148, um, let's say 1471 times, we got November, December, January, February, March, April, May. So let's do seven months minus 247 times seven. All right, so 8,568. So I'll just say 8,500, 148, nine. 20 minus 8,500. So the balance would be somewhere around that. And let's say her rate goes from 1.99% to 8%. Let's say it jumps. Prime right now is 8.5% or 8.25. I think I forgot. Um, and it looks like the feds are not going to increase interest rates, but they're not decreasing it. I, they're not decreasing it either. So we might see interest rates drop by June of next year. I would assume that might be the case. If if so, I think it's reasonable to estimate around 8%. So if I owe 140 by June 2024, just by making that normal payment, times that by 8% and divided by 12, the interest only payment jumped 3x plus 93664, right? That's the interest only payment. This is principal and interest. So if we do 1,471 minus 24708, so they're adding an extra $1,200 as the principal payment. Her payment would nearly double. So her payment jumps to 2,160.56, pretty high. And at, at that point, that really cuts into her cash flow big time. So 2,160.56 minus 1,000. 471. So her payment goes up nearly $700. Whatever she recaptured in cash flow, she'll she'll lose it to that. So you'll want to explain that to her because most people will think, let me attack the smallest debt. Right, let me get that done. You know, it's 29%. That's 14%. That's 29%. That's 6.78. This is only at 1.99, Denzel. Right? I did all my home renovations in there and spent a bunch of money and it's like, they're watching that that you know they're just covering that payment for right now but they're gonna get that's how this is how most people screw up their helocs they misuse it they don't use it properly so we can expect roughly a 700 hundred dollar increase in the payment if we don't do velocity banking right now on on the debt tool second my marker was dying so now Let's say she agrees, says, okay, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to do velocity banking on the debt tool itself. The goal is to create as much space as humanly possible. Again, I don't know what the credit limit is, but I'm assuming that it's close to being maxed out. And my goal would be to, again, create as much equity available credit in the line of credit between now and June. Don't spend no more money. Don't go into more debt, right? Avoid going into debt as much as possible. This is the information that I'd be sharing with her, right? Be very, very disciplined, just like all hands on deck to reduce that balance. And then what we can do, depending on how much space we create, and also depending on what the rate goes to, we could move some of the debts over here into the HELOC at that later point in time. The other thing that we could potentially do 
is go to a different bank and get another intro rate. So when that expires, we could build a relationship with another bank in say March of 2024 and just have a have a, a bank in our sites that they're doing another intro rate at 1.99% or or 3% or 4%, whatever the intro rate is for another six months, 12 months, and we can move that entire balance over to the next bank to keep riding on the uh, intro rate period. So that's something that could potentially be done. Let's just put that in the back burner. Nothing to concern ourselves with right now, but by next year, it's something that we could consider. All right, so let's run these numbers to see what it would look like over the next seven months, roughly, starting Velocity Banking out the gate. We're in November 2023. We're at the top of the month, which is perfect. So she will be generating 5,514.16. Whatever cash flow she has from last month, October, can go in there into the HELOC as well. If there's no cash flow from last month, fine. We're starting fresh. All right. So that's what I'm going to assume. Starting fresh. So minus income, 5,514.16. Again, this is in, uh, two times, right? So the money gets split it's not all at once that the balance goes down to 143 right, so this is just me doing like a uh, an estimated interest assumption the more the more accurate thing to do would be to find out when exactly are her pay periods and we can literally map out the next seven months just looking at all the different pay periods and that'll give us a a clearer interest cost whereas this will be overestimated so whatever i illustrate it's going to be an overestimation all right so income in balance is here 143 expenses going out is the 1966.93 and the 884.01 times that times both of these numbers at 1.99 percent and then divide by 365. can you just go over how you put down the debt payment and the Four thousand three twenty one nine four is the number she gave us of everything that that is going out. This fourteen seventy one is going to disappear the moment I start doing velocity banking because my income going into the HELOC is my payment, so it satisfies that before it's even due. Now, because this payment is going to the HELOC and we're using the HELOC the way we're using it, the fourteen seventy one is not coming out of the HELOC that that money stays in there. So technically what we're looking at is what's coming out of the line. So I did this number right here, 1,096693 is all of these numbers, all of these numbers. And then the, the difference, 4,321.94 minus 1,471, you should get this number, right? 4,321.94 minus 1,471, all right? So it's 2,000, whoops. 2,859.4. All right, so let me see what I did there. Let me just make sure I'm not making a mistake. 2,859.4. And what I did here earlier, my 1,096693 number. So we'll just verify that real quick. So 30 plus 30 plus 38, 16, 78, 19205, and then 260. 254 1282 right so that number is is good and i think where i made the mistake here let me see where i made the mistake so that you can see it as well so 4,321 minus 1471 is that number so the difference between that and we've got living expenses so 4,321 Four minus eight eighty four oh one. Let me see where I got that number from. So that's what I. Why did I do that? Let's see that. Let me erase this for now. Fourteen seventy one. That's all that should be coming out. That's there we go. So now it's two eight five zero nine four minus one thousand nine six six ninety three. That's how I got that number. Okay. So now it's eight eighty four oh one plus debt. Payments leaving 2,859.4. So I actually, that 3,000 number was a mistake. So what's moving forward, her expenses are now with this number, 2,850.94, leaving the home equity line of credit. And that's that's these two numbers added up. Now, what'll happen, we're, we're still paying interest. So 
when I run the math here, you'll see the number that I'll get. It'll most likely be lower than that, right? Okay. So the, the cash flow gain here is so much higher than every other move we would have made, right? Because 1,471 minus 24708, we got 1,200 ish of cash flow. So that 1,200 plus her 1,192, boom, it's all sitting in that HELOC, 100% principal paying down that 148. Cool. So there was a little hiccup there, but my numbers were right. I, I didn't actually mess that up. I just somehow thought that number was our total outgoing and it's actually much less. So it's 2,850, right? So in that regard, this might be wrong. So let's just make sure. So 148,996,20 minus income plus expenses, uh, debt payments plus 884. Okay, no. So we're clear. So I didn't mess up. I just was confusing myself. So now one, four, three. Are we good on that? Was that good? All right, perfect. This is $7.82. So this is where the balance fluctuates for the month of November. It'll be as low as 143, as high as 146. Once we're at the end of the month, we start at 148. And I won't ever owe interest on 148 because I immediately dump my income into this. So I might owe interest for like a day or something like that. Um, but again, so I'm just going to take these two numbers right here. So 782 plus 797. I'm going to divide it by 2 times 30 days. So that's pretty accurate estimated interest for the month of November. 236.89. That 236.89, when, when she's using her HELOC, this 236.89 is not coming from her paycheck. 236.89 is coming from within the available credit in the HELOC because that's where her income went, right? So just make sure that when she's doing this, depending on how the HELOC is set up, sometimes the bank will do it automatically where they'll pull this from the available credit in the HELOC and then you'll just see the balance increase on the HELOC itself. Sometimes they don't do that and then you have to manually make the payment, right? If that's the case, you just tell her, hey, when this is due on the due date, you withdraw 236.89 from the HELOC to your checking account. And then your checking account, you make a payment to the HELOC interest 236.89. That's how that'll work. So what we do here is 236.89 plus 146.332.98. Now we owe 146.569.87 cents. Do it all over. All right. So now we're in, that was November. Now we're in December minus income. Just going to go a little bit faster now. Expenses out. I'm going to use that number now. And all I'm doing to get the daily rate, I'm just timesing it by 1.99%. And then I'm dividing it by 365 to get the daily borrowing costs. And I'm doing it on both numbers. Then I'm adding both of them up. And I'm dividing by two to get the median average daily balance costs over a 30 day period. I get $7.76 times it by 30 days. We're at 232. So now if I want to if I want to be a little bit quicker here, I could make the assumption, if all goes well, keep doing this, from 236.89 to 232.95, what was that difference? 236.89 minus 232.95. It's about a $4 difference. So $3.94. So what I could do, right, is just say, okay, uh, every month moving forward, I'm just going to reduce the interest cost by about $3.94. Now, to make this faster, this would be critical to help offset this, this interest cost. It's already at a super low rate. 1.99% is ridiculously low. 232, 236, 247 on 148,000 owed is like really good. So we're just making it even better. Uh, so just going to overestimate here and say that the, the balance is decreasing by $3.94 each month. So 143,906,65, add the interest, 232. Here's where we're at. We're at 144,139,60, end of December, beginning of January, minus income plus expenses, 141,476 plus interest. This is how you would draw it out. For the client this is how you would start to go a little bit faster in the conversation to try to map out what the next six nine twelve months would look like 
you just take that that estimation so you, you map out velocity banking for three months and then that second to third month is a nice overestimated amount of money by how much it'll be dropping by and that just shows the client that hey every single month that you do velocity banking you pay less and less interest and you're recapturing cash flow so next month you get three dollars and 94 cent more cash flow that's paying down your HELOC balance doesn't sound like a lot but over a period of time it does make a difference and again you're you're actually paying down debt faster than you would at making extra payments of 1192 to that third to get thirty dollars to then get thirty dollars to then get thirty eight dollars instantaneously over here we got twelve hundred dollars in one shot and it's the same money that's paying down the debt so 229.01 at the balance 141 4768 that's january now we're at 1417053 income plus expenses 22507 february at the balance whoops 139267 minus income march around this time i'm going to start looking at other banks in my in my area other credit union um do you know where she got this one from yeah ask her that too ask her where she got that i know there's a couple banks right now doing it so 36 four the other cool part about what we're doing here is if she gets an, uh, an a raise at her job between now and then this also improves the situation even further so we're not gonna account for that do you know if she's married I'm just single. single okay all right so it's just her income right to one april plus 134 minus income all right we're getting close all right we go from 148 down to around 129 by june 2024 that's when my 1.99 rate expires let's do an estimate let's see what the monthly payment would increase to now so one two nine two six five nine three plus two oh nine thirty one times eight percent right by so we brought it from 936 down to 63 with 16 so our cash flow gets reduced from that 209 number right so 86316 minus 20931 so we're going to lose right around $653.85 in in cash flow which at at this point to now help with that we could either go to a different bank get a new intro rate at a different bank to bring that down even further one option second option we could maybe leverage a zero percent credit card and move a portion of the balance out of the heloc have it sit in the credit card it's not going to do a whole lot uh, slight yeah so not a whole lot so that could be something or we go to a credit union where we can get a zero percent credit card on purchases and balance transfers and we could potentially do a balance transfer on a bunch of however many credit cards we can doesn't cost me anything to move all that debt to zero and it's going to reduce it's going to reduce my monthly payment that difference comes to the HELOC so I think I would personally still want to keep doing velocity banking we did it for two three four five six seven eight months I would like to go another four more months paying down this HELOC a little more, creating more space, at which, <clears throat> at which at that point, I would be very tempted to move some of these debts into the HELOC. Now, I, I could do it right in June. I could, right? It's just gonna, it's just gonna increase the interest costs. Um, so let's say, obviously this one would fall off, right? So I would, I would get $30 there so that would be done so thirty dollars times seven payments minus 29.24 percent so i'll do a thousand five minus 148 so we got 857 for that debt 38 16 times seven minus 29.99 percent 187 3816 minus 187 3629 these are business credit cards so does she have a business or are they just business credit cards that she applied for do you know she, she has, I don't know, she income right now. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to skip over the business yet for now. Go to the car. Car is 262 times 7 payment minus 6.78%. 1709. So I'll just do 1700. 6822 minus 1700. Our balance will be somewhere around that number. It'll probably be less. Probably be like five. I mean more actually. Probably be more. I assume. Somewhere around there. 5200. And I ignore the student loan. Ignore the mortgage. That'll be what it is then so you could do a a small chunk here in june 857 3629 it's 5200 so say you did a 10k chunk that's totally overestimated right 10k chunk to get back 262 plus 38 plus 30 plus 30 from that other card that just naturally fell off on its own 360.16 in cash flow let's see what that would do to our net borrowing costs 86316 <clears throat> 86, based off this number right here at an 8% interest rate to see if this makes sense to borrow 10k to eliminate those higher interest debts push them over here the way it'll make sense is if after 1 month of doing velocity banking if the number is at 86316 or lower if it's lower then that means you gained that 360 did not get eaten up in interest. If it gets eaten up in interest, then you didn't do anything. And you just moved more debt into a location. And because the volume of interest on the amount owed, it ate up the cash flow. So you didn't do anything. It looked like you did something because you're like, oh, I moved 29 to 8. But because the 8 is on a higher amount owed, yeah. you, you get that, right? You see that part? <clears throat> so that'll be something that you also explain to the client. And then you can prove it right now. So we're at 360.16 is the cash flow recovery here. This is overestimated, 10,000. It's actually less. So let me let me do the lesser number, right? Because I don't want to be too ridiculous here. And then 857. So it's 9,686 plus, plus the 129.265.93 plus that month's interest, 209.31. So now we owe... 139k 6124285094 minus 36016 our new expense number is 2490 minus income plus well let me write that down 33 plus expenses 249078 i'm actually going to add all these three numbers up 139 one six one two four times eight percent. Look at that. See thirty dollars and fifty cents a day, as opposed to where we were at like seven. Makes a big difference. One three three six four seven eight times eight percent. Twenty nine twenty nine three six one three seven. Add these three up. Twenty nine twenty nine thirty fifty divide by three times eight ninety six. Overestimated, of course. In reality, the actual interest we we could potentially have that right near the 863, which is not too bad, right? So again, if you get it right at 863.16, that means you fully recaptured the 360. If it's above it, then you you lost some of it, but not all of it. So the good part is from 360.16. 896 minus 86316. We lost $33 to interest. In my opinion here, this is a win, right? If I would have lost over 50%, 75%. Sorry, can you, can you just keep going with that one time? Like, like I got lost. I don't know. Just keep going. Uh, so um, the 86316, what's that number again? Okay, so 86316 is interest borrowing costs on this number 129,265.93 plus the 209.31 now okay. that's at eight percent that's at 8% right interest rate expired so now let's just say we're at eight if we were to make this chunk of 9,686 to get three hundred and sixty dollars and sixteen cents that's cash flow recovered because I I consolidated debt from over here to over here okay. right now, my, my goal personally is I want to be able to recover 
a true 360, 16, as, as much as I possibly can. And the way to determine that is to do velocity banking at that new higher balance, do the math, and to see, do you get to 863.16? If you get lower, then you're like, that's really good. If you get right at 863.16, then you're like, this is a good move. If you're above it, now it just depends on how much above are we. We're not too far off, right? From 863 to 896. The 30, 15, 20, 29. Is that the, um, the, the borrowing cost for the, for, the, for the month? For the day. on For, the, for, the day. for however long I owe that number balance, however long I own that balance, however long I owe that balance. So what this assumes here is that I owed 139 for 10 days, 133 for 10 days, 136 for 10 days, you get 896. In reality, that's that's not happening. In in reality, I, I will never owe 139, 161 for more than two days or even a day, depending on like where I am in the, in the month. So if I was to do the 2929 number plus the 28. 83 divided by 2 times 30. Now it's 886. And if I'm using a credit card to run cashback rewards and maybe I get 20 to 30 dollars in cashback rewards, then you're right at that 863.16 number. At this point, this makes sense. This makes sense to move 29%, 29%, 6.78% eight percent. 8%. 8% becomes less than 8%, our net borrowing cost is more like maybe 6 Okay, gotcha. So for your client here, this is done, this is done, this is done, this is done. Her cash flow is 2000 plus, <clears throat> right around 886.80 interest, right? So look, you do 886.80 plus her expenses, that's money that left the HELOC 2004 90 her her total actual cost of living is 3377 58 her income minus expenses that's her cash flow by June 2024 so we pretty much doubled her cash flow and what's super cool here all that cash flow that she dedicated to paying down the HELOC is available right where we end off at around 136 137 136 137 plus interest costs right around here 137 024 66 148 996 20 minus 137 024 we have about twelve thousand dollars of space unexpected expenses emergencies come up she can pull from the heloc to get her through that that season right and then Again, we don't know how much her credit limit is. Once we do find that out, then you would add that as your gap, right? At this at this point, you get to June of 2024, and we make this chunk great. We prove the math that it makes sense to reroute those debts into there. Nothing more though, right? Because if you if you did more, then you're losing more cash flow, right? So it may not be worth it. Plus, you're getting closer to that 148 which I'm assuming is close to almost maxing out the HELOC. So I don't want to have, I don't want to have too much owed on my HELOC. I don't want to be too over leveraged. So at this point, you would tell her, hey, velocity banking for the next six to nine months, do nothing but that. Keep paying the monthly minimums on everything else and just knock this down. Actually, what's really good is to say, keep doing velocity banking until we get to October of 2024. So that's June, July, August, September, October. So that's five months. That's within this window right here. This expires. That payment's going to jump on her, right? So that's going to take from her cash flow a little bit. Um, so we might be tempted to to pay that off, right? Stick it in here, right? Or get the 192, stick it in there. So we'll we'll look at that. But no more no more chunking after that. You already chunked. You know, hopefully we got a raise by then. Maybe we're making a little bit more money. And that really, you know, helps with situation overall but this is a really good scenario here really the key thing for her now is to follow it right stay disciplined don't waste money um tell her about i tell my clients this um often that when you do velocity banking sometimes you can fall into this illusion that you have more money when you don't so the velocity banking illusion is that you are doing velocity banking 
All right, you're making all this progress and all of a sudden, I'm gonna go on a vacation and spend $7,000. Yeah. Now, so now that increases and that messes up our chunk date, pushes that back. And if they chunked after doing that move and they chunk, they're messing up that number, right? They're messing up that recovery and cash flow. So we would need to advise them, hey, don't chunk because you did not follow this plan to the T. So we put, we need to push our chunk date back. And you know, it, if there was an unexpected expense or a, a life emergency or something like that, totally understandable, but it would still push back the chunk date. So we don't want to abuse that. Right? So you monitor it month to month with her. You say, Hey, this is our parameter. This is what we should be within based on the numbers that you provide. Right? If things change, the strategy does not change. You still dump all income in, take expenses out, cash flow stays. The only thing that'll happen is your chunk date will get pushed out however long it takes us to get to that number. When we get to 129, it'll make sense at 8% to make a chunk of 9,686 to pay off those debts. Cool? Um, I've got two quick questions. What, what's, the, what's the um concept behind when do you know that when the last one makes is not a tool for uh, someone to use? Like, like, so, yeah, that's before I ask the next question. What's the, when do you know that the last thing is like basically not to use anymore? It's just a service. So typically, the the giveaways. I'll I'll give the easy give, giveaways here, and that gives you a nice parameter to work with. Once someone enters a negative cash flow position, we're no longer trying to pay down debt. We're trying to buy time. So they would still. You know, let's say her expenses go above 5K. We wouldn't stop doing velocity bank. It still makes sense. Dump all income in, take expenses out. There's no cash flow. The balance is higher than the previous month, right? But the way it goes higher, it's going to go higher slower than if she was to stop doing velocity banking and just pull from it to cover bills. Make sense? Yeah. So the goal at that point is to get her back to a positive cash flow position. But we wouldn't be chunking, wouldn't be moving debt from one loan to another, stop all that. So that's where velocity banking would stop being effective once I enter a negative cash flow position. Also, the um, the interest rate on the debt tool itself. If the interest rate on debt tool is higher than what you are paying off, you want to double check the math. Because sometimes, sometimes a higher rate on the line of credit versus what I'm paying off if, the, if it's a lesser rate. Sometimes it does make sense to move it over here because we're not actually ever paying that higher rate. So it's important to know what is your net effective rate. If the effective rate less than what you're paying off. So for example, that 6.78% is going to be compared to my borrowing costs on 8% on the line of credit here, you could argue, then I don't know if that makes sense. You could definitely argue that. And the way you would make sense of it is you say, well, that borrowing costs ended up being a little higher. So you might say, you know what, if I can't get a lower rate on my HELOC at 8%, if I can't switch it to get below 6.78, then we could say we could leave that alone, right? Leave that alone. Don't actually pay off this car, pay this off instead. Right. So when we get to June, like let's let's reconvene definitely on this case study. When we get to June 2024, we want to see how much interest is left on that 262 because this is an amortized loan and it has a fixed interest per month and it gets lower and lower the further we go into the amortized. So when you're at when you're at the beginning of an amortized loan, there's more interest to recover when you're getting towards the end or the middle break even point. Typically, velocity banking will not make sense if your line of credit is at a higher rate than what it is you're paying off. So in this example here, I'm assuming that would be the case. We get to June of next year, the balance is at like five grand, right? 6.78%. To move that over here, it might not make sense, right? And I, it kind of revealed itself right here, kind of revealed itself. So if you moved 27.49 and got that 192.05, yes, it's a higher chunk than the five, but I'm also, I'm almost certain you would do better in cash flow difference when we get to that point, right? So that's something that we can play with. And then you would just keep paying the monthly minimum payment on that car and it could, 
it'll probably just fall off on its own, right, in, in time. So that's that's a good thing to pay attention to is like, wh what's my rate at on my debt tool? That eight, what's my net borrowing cost? Can I bring my net borrowing cost less than 6.78? If I can do that, I also need to compare it to if I would have just made extra payments to knock that down, right? Because you can, you can go from velocity banking back to making extra payments, extra payments back to velocity banking to get the maximum results. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. So always be paying attention to what is the net borrowing cost, the rate on the debt tool. Is it higher than whatever it is I'm paying off? I need to double check that math and run that with the client. But that's, those are the, the biggest things is, is typically that. And then also the client's goals. Like, does the client actually want to pay off their mortgage? If, if not, then we could stop velocity banking to pay off debt and do velocity banking to leverage to acquire another property to create more cash flow, more income. Sorry. Say again? Yeah. Right. So the other, the other thing is if client does not want to pay off debt you usually won't run into this issue most people do want to pay off their debt and then invest and then increase their income some want to do both so if you get that kind of a client that's like hey i want to pay off some of my debt but uh, i don't mind having my mortgage at six percent right now i think that i could invest and earn triple that in rate of return so that's where you would change the strategy from Instead of velocity banking to pay off debt, it would be velocity banking to increase income cash flow. Sometimes, if they don't want to leverage at all, they can just have their whatever their cash flow is and dedicate that into building capital. But typically, having capital to leverage at a relatively low rate is pretty nice. It speeds up the process. And if this is a client that has been doing velocity banking to pay off debt, they've gotten really good at discipline being very effective.